In this video, Dr. Steenbarger and I share tips for successful trading, focusing on the trading psychology every trader needs. Hi, I'm Mike Bellafieri, co-founder of SMB Capital, and we're a proprietary trading firm located in Midtown Manhattan. And I'm also the author of the trading classic, One Good Trade, and the playbook. In this video, Dr. Steenbarger and I are interviewed by Trade Society on what is essential to become a successful trader. Let's get to work on sharing those important trading lessons so you can grow your trading account. So hello, everybody. We are back on the Traders Improve podcast. And today we have a very special episode. As you can see, um, I'm very honored to have Mike Bellafiori and Dr. Brett Steenbarger here with us. First of all, thank you for making the time. It's a, it's a huge honor. Uh, you've both been, um, I've followed you since I've started trading. So this is a very special episode for me. Well, thank you. Uh, and first, a few words just so that people have, a, have an un understanding, but I'm sure most of you will know. Dr. Steenbarger is a psychologist, a trader, and also an author of multiple books, such as The Daily Trading Coach, Psychology of Trading, Trading Psychology 2.0, and Radical Renewal. And um, he also works as a coach um, for SMB. And uh, that's why we also have Mike Bellafiori here, who is a co-founder at SMB Capital, which is a prop trading firm in New York and also an author of uh, One Good Trade and The Playbook. So we have, and this is a great opportunity to, to pick your brains. Um, I love trading psychology and mindset, and I am very deep into spirituality, which I want to get into later as well. But um, yeah, so we reached out to our audience and our community as well, what they would like to ask you. And there are just a, a mix of questions that I find very interesting. So the first one to get into, um, from your own experience as a, as a coach, as a mentor, what really stands up out about um, winning traders and losing traders? Are there specific traits and habits? What is the thing that really stands out about, about those two uh, groups of traders? Mike, you want to start? Yeah, I will start. And uh, we're very lucky to work with Dr. Steenbarker, who does coach Uh, our traders and, and coaches, hedge fund traders throughout the world. Um, and very fortunate to pick his brain on just about everything. And uh, good to talk with him and you guys today. Great question. So I, I want to see guys who are willing to get better every day. I want to see guys who will grow from the start of their career throughout. And so, you know, one of the things that I find particularly interesting since running a proprietary trading firm is that we hire two tranches of people. We hire people from college or internship program. You apply for an internship. Uh, if you become an intern, you become a junior intern. If you do really well, we invite you to become a senior intern. The best of the senior interns are offered an invitation to trade in our desk and trade firm capital and tap into the enormous resources like our technology, our capital, and you know, great coaches like Dr. Steenbarger. Uh, and be around fantastic traders who are doing exceptionally well in markets. And so we have that tranche of people and uh, we are incredibly excited about that tranche. Our history shows we should be very grateful for how that tranche of traders have done. They, many of them have gone on to become very successful traders. The best have gone on to become seven figure traders and even uh, this year, eight figure traders. But not only have they become eight figure traders, but they do so in a way where they very much control their risk, their risk reward, their return on investment, their max excursion are just all off the charts. And Dr. Seabarger sees all their numbers and works with them. And, and can speak to that. It, they're not just making a lot of money, but they're making a money unusually efficiently. And, and those are the traders we're sort of bringing up from the beginning. And, and the one thing that I think we do really well at our firm is encourage people to continue trying to be better, to build from their strengths, to study their strengths, not just the trades, 
that they trade pretty well, but the routine that allows them to trade at their best. And then how do they get better from there? So it wasn't that long ago, I was in Miami having a conversation with the highest PL trader at our firm from the year before. And we identified five things that this trader could do if he wanted to be an eight, eight bigger trader. And he was unusually receptive to the things he needed to do. He was seeking out the things he needed to do to get better from me. And I'm sure he's having conversations with other people, but we outlined these five things and that trader did those things. And this year that trader has become an eight figure trader. Already in the middle and of even, the year. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's we're in the middle of the year. He's an oh, eight figure trader. Nice. I, I, I think he's up north of $12 million. Oh. Um, and so, and, and you know, he still has room to get better. And that's true of the other top traders at the firm as well. They still have room to get better from here. And uh, that, that is, so, so that's what I want to sort of see. I, you want guys who are talented. You want guys that are willing to get better every day, that will do the work, not talk the talk, but actually put their heads down in the quiet, do the review, seek out the help, tap into the coaching, push themselves to get better, make themselves feel uncomfortable, building from their strengths. Um, and, and then when I contrast that with some of the experienced traders who apply to the firm that we'd love to sort of get better at, uh, it, it's very clear to us having a history of working with lots of experienced traders that we need to make sure that they're adopting that growth mentality as it is and not just allowing them to come in and do what they sort of want to do. And if we do just let them come in and do what they want to do, they're not going to be as good as the guys who are homegrown and uh, you know, maybe worse. Mm -hmm. So as, as a guy who runs a prop firm, that's important to me. Right. That's great. That's great, Mike. Uh, by the way, Moritz and Rolf, uh, I'm an eight figure trader also but the first figure is a decimal point. <laughs> just, 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 just saying, you know, <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, uh, you know, I totally agree with what Mike says. And obviously Mike and I work together with the traders at SMB. So we've seen them grow up together, but I'm going to add one dimension that Mike uh, didn't go into detail about. So, and I'll do that by asking Moritz, Rolf, I'll ask you the question. How many people get to be an Olympic champion in a sporting event by training and learning totally on their own? Mm. No one. <laughs> no one. <laughs> that, that's the null set, as the mathematicians say. No. That, yeah, they always have coaching. They always have mentoring. They always learn with others. That is so important. It's the teamwork component, which is there with the SMB traders. And it's the willingness to learn with others and from others and collaborate. So, so, so important. That's what makes being an independent trader so difficult because the independent trader, it's easy to become an isolated trader. So mm -hmm. we need communities. We need groups that can learn together and build in some of that teamwork. If you want to learn three real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing right now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That's going to open up this free registration page in the new window. So don't worry, you're not going to lose this video. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. We saw this recently when COVID hit. Now our firm was a physical firm, mostly. Traders came into an office, we worked with them in person, we communicated with them in person, we had meetings with them in person, and then when COVID hit, we had to become 
like independent traders. We, we had to do everything from a distance. And it was, but it was an opportunity for us to improve the way that we communicated and improve the way that we communicated virtually. So we set up, just like independent traders can do, Dr. Steenbarger, we set up a bunch of specific rooms for the guys to audio chat and, and in written chat communicate. Mm-hmm. And we set up a bunch of video conferences for our mentoring sessions where everybody could be on camera and communicate with each other. And we have actually found in some cases being apart improved our ability to communicate together. And so, Hey, if we can figure out how to communicate better all virtually, and I'm coming to you from Spring Lake, New Jersey, we picked up our family from New York city and moved over here to the Jersey shore. And we're running the, the firm from the Jersey Shore. And Dr. Steenbarger is coming to you from his house uh, in Connecticut. And that's how we're all working. You know, we're all a bunch of independent traders inside a firm structure, communicating and, and helping each other. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Dr. Steenbarger, but I thought oh, that that a great was point. It? You're making a great point, you know, being separate pushes us to work more together. And I think that's what some of the listeners to today's session might want to take away. Where I teach at a medical school in Syracuse, New York, you know, the saying is each one teach one. Mm -hmm. Everyone's a teacher. Everyone's a learner. Mm -hmm. The number in the research that I've done at several hedge funds, the number one predictor of success in terms of traits is Rolf Moritz. What would you guess? (laughs) Teamwork, I guess. (laughs) What's that? Teamwork. That's important. Teamwork and team, yeah, probably. Mm. Taking responsibility. That's very important. So that goes with a trait called conscientiousness. So that was very important in the research. Number one though is intellectual curiosity. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. The desire to learn, the drive to learn, that's what, you know, even when the p and is not there, that's what keeps us growing because we're just so eager to learn and people who are eager to learn will share with each other and are mm-hmm. eager to share because that feeds the curiosity. Mm-hmm. The people who just want p and for their trading, they don't have that curiosity as soon as the PL is not there, what's going to keep them motivated? Right. Yeah. And they're also going to trade their PL probably. <laughs> I've seen that before. Uh, we have one trader who uh, you and I know very, very well, who is probably just about the best person um, <clears throat> and somebody that you would just think a lot of, even if they weren't a really good trader. And for years, this trader wasn't a seven figure trader. And every time I would see him of late, I would remind him that he could be a seven-figure trader and that he should expect himself to be a seven-figure trader. He kept working on a particular strategy that he ran that had lots of efficiency and uh, this year became a seven-figure trader. But this year, even after finally accomplishing that goal, he is working on broadening what he does. So he's got this one area of trading that is expert and as good as anybody on the street in that one area, hit his goal, finally gets there. And he's still curious. He wants to add price action trading Mm -hmm. to his playbook, which selectively he can add. And if selectively he adds that, he's going to add another huge revenue line to his type of trading. Right. The question that comes up always in this context for me is um, how do you deal with uh, system hopping in that sense? Many traders, um, when you tell them, especially new traders, you tell them, okay, you need to stick to a strategy and you need to make it work. Nothing will work right from the start. And then the results are not great and they are tempted to system hop. How do you, how do you deal with that, that you make them or you encourage them to stick to, to what they're doing instead of 
just chasing so many different areas. Especially if you are part of a group, like a prop trading group, where some other people are already making millions of dollars with the strategy that, and you are learning something different. And you think, oh, maybe I want to hop on this train. And then the next day, another trade is doing better. And then you want to try this strategy and so on. I think it's also difficult, right? I'll just share the evolution of our firm. So I used to teach people, and Steve, my partner, Steve Spencer, my partner, I used to teach, teach people how we traded. We were mostly momentum traders. We did a lot of scalping. And that's how we traded people when we first started SMB in 2005. And then that became a lot harder. You had to be even more selective with your momentum trading. Uh, HFTs forced traders to be even more selective and even better at that strategy to the point where less people were having success than in the past. And, you know, we recognized that we were seeing talented people come into our firm who were not doing as well as, as we thought they would do. And, We, we recognized that the way that we were doing things needed some rethinking. And so when we did that rethinking, we, we said to ourselves, why don't we instead expose our traders to the different types of strategies that the guys in our desk are trading and having success with, put those in front of them, let traders, let each trader try those different types of strategies. And just to sort of give you a number, 19, 20 different strategies. Let's expose them to 19 or 20 different strategies. It's a course that everybody takes called the winning trader at our firm. People come in before you show up at SMB, you take SMB DNA. Then you take the winning trader uh, if you're hired at the desk. And then you experiment with those different types of strategies. As you're experimenting with them, you yourself, decide which are the ones that make the most sense to you. You yourself decide which are going to be the best based on your unique skills, your unique talents. What's your personality best suited for? What's your cognitive abilities best suited for? What type of trading is, is the, the best type of trading for you? What types of setups are the best types of setups for you? So you know, if you're very fast thinking, then being a scalper, can make a lot of sense. If you have the personality uh, where you don't like to give back a lot of profits and scalping can be the right personality for you. If you're very analytical, then you know, maybe you want to do some M&A trading or some more sophisticated type of trading like some one of our guys, Michael Wilgus does, which is very different than a lot of the trading that the guys on our desk do. Um, and if we made somebody like Uh, you know, our very analytical trader, scalp, 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 learn this strategy that I use when I first started trading that, that really worked for a long period of time. It works for really good traders and maybe works for somebody like Swang, you know, another eight figure trader on our desk. You've got to do this. If you don't do this, then we're going to fire you. <laughs> We would, what would happen was a lot of very talented people would be very frustrated. We would be very frustrated. They would fail. They would have to go do something else because uh, we weren't providing the education and the training that would develop them, mm -hmm. that would develop their unique talents. And, and this is very heavily influenced on uh, the mentoring and teaching of Dr. Steve Barker, which is he's encouraging people continually to read his blog and you listen to the mentoring sessions he does with us to be tapping into your unique talents. Uh, and he'll counsel, what were you good at in the past, why were you good at that? Think about that. And then can you find the type of trading that taps into those unique talents? And so uh, we let guys develop a playbook around the trades that best fit their talents and help them develop those, that type of trading and those setups from there. Right. So in the beginning, it's maybe okay to do a little bit of system hopping as long. Well, I guess it's a fine line where, when do you stop until, when do you stop to look for something that fits your psychology or your mental makeup? Yeah. I mean, one of the great advantages of working at a prop firm is we're going to give you a lot of time. You know, we're essentially going to give you a year to show that you've made progress. As long as you've made progress over the course of one year, we're okay with that. And we're going to give you a couple of years before we really expect for you 
to be uh, making some decent money. Right. So you have the, the time in the room. And, and also remember, the people that we're hiring on the desk are coming from our internship class. So you've interned, you've been in college, you've got to try some stuff as you're going through college. Uh, you have eyes wide open as to what this job is all about. And when you're, when you're starting, you should be in a pretty good space to be able to trade your niche trade your playbook, focus on consistency. And then we're going to give you a couple of years for the most part. Um, that, that's, that's going to give you the, the time to experiment. I, mm -hmm. I believe, and, and maybe other people have a different philosophy, and, and I'm sure there's, I'm just sharing with you what, what's worked well for us and, and how we run things. I'm not in any way suggesting this is the way to do things. Um, but uh, we, Mike, we believe- Mike, can I jump yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the way you find out what sport you're good at is by playing many different sports, right? And, yeah. and so you have to be able to trade different markets, different strategies, and, and see what makes sense to you, what works for you, what fits with your strengths. And you have to do that in simulation mode to begin with, or else you'll lose too much money during your learning curve. In medical school, the medical students take three years before they declare a possible specialty area. They, they do rotations and they try out the different specialties. They try out surgery. They try out internal medicine. They try out psychiatry. Very different areas. And they figure out what they love, what plays to their skills, and then they start to specialize but they need that time, as Mike says, to experiment. Mm, I yeah. like that a lot, yeah. Because yeah. in the beginning, when, when I started trading out, I had huge problems with finding my style. Coming from being a poker player, I wanted the constant action all the time, but everyone on the internet was saying, scalping doesn't work. Never trade the one-minute chart. It's for losers and idiots. So I didn't even try it, but at the end, it was, for me personally, the best style. So... If, if you find a style that really fits your personality, you are not prone to system hopping eventually because you know this is, I mean, this is who I am and this is what I do, right? Oh. I can Excellent. show you a few traders and their P&L uh, who have deployed that strategy of scalping on one meta charts mm -hmm. and uh, you can uh, then bring it back to the people that call you an idiot for thinking that that isn't profitable. Exactly. It's, it's, it can be very profitable. It can be challenging for lots of different people, but for the right people, it's enormously profitable. No. Right. So I guess in the beginning, it's okay to give yourself maybe a year, maybe two, without focusing necessarily on trying to make a lot of money initially, but just trying out different things, see how they relate, how you relate to them, what makes sense, and then you can make an educated decision. Because many people I see, they are trying to just, to just make the money right from the start, but they never take the time to to really see what makes sense to them. It's a great point, Rolf. Uh, you know, people are going into trading, they want to make money fast. And think about any activity, any performance activity. Think about being a musician. Think about being an actor or actress. Think about being an athlete. It takes years to develop elite skill. Why would it be different in financial markets? So we have to give ourselves that period of learning, experimenting, and, and training and have the patience. If we love markets, we can get through that learning period. But if it's just about making money, we won't be able to tolerate the ups and downs and the frustrations. And that's mm -hmm. why so many new traders end up leaving. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. This brings me to a question which was sent in from, a, from one of our students. And um, it's a very specific question, but I think people can relate to it. She's in a position or he or uh, where she has been trading for a while. She can trade quite well, but um, she can't afford to lose money. So this puts her in a position where she feels like, like she has a lot of blockage inside and she can't execute the trades. And I think many people have similar issues where you just can't afford, especially during those times when money is not abundant anyway, how do you, how do you get over, over this blockage? Uh, I'll, I'll tackle that. 
because I work so closely with risk managers at, uh, at funds. If you can't afford to lose money, then you shouldn't be trading, period. <laughs> because, right. I mean, I work with some very, very talented traders, and at times they all draw down. You know, if, if you have a 60% win rate on your trades, you can calculate the probability of having X number of losing trades in a row. Everyone draws down. So there has to be some cushion. And that means for many people, starting by trading in simulation, not with risk, and starting to trade very small and just learn the consistency of the trading, and then you can grow the account. If it's possible, when you develop some of that consistency, you can join a proprietary trading firm like an SMB, and they will provide capital for you so that your money is not so much at risk. Mm -hmm. But it's too much pressure on people if they cannot afford to lose, if you need that money for your family, you know, to, to feed your family, that's way too much pressure. There's enough pressure in markets as it is. You want to be able to lose money and um, not have that freak you out. Mm -hmm. And I'll add to that. We have one trader up eight figures this year. And last month he drew down about a million dollars. And not only does Dr. Seymour make a good point about how if your system eventually, uh, even if it's a good system, you, you, you will draw down, but really great traders also trade poorly at times, even the best traders. And so a combination of trading really poorly and making some big plays that didn't work out caused one of these traders to draw down a million dollars, something that he would not be able to withstand if he was just trading his personal account. But, you know, because he can risk many, many, many multiples of dollars at a prop firm, the million dollar drawdown is an opportunity for him to get some coaching and talk to Dr. Steenbarger and to say, you know, which part of that was some bad trading, which part of that was good and keep doing that to get some instruction from some of the partners and some of the leaders of the firm to say, remember how you trade well, remember what that looks like. Uh, and then that trader by, by the end of the month, I think had made back almost all of it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, is off and running this month as opposed to, you know, being an independent trader who, has lost way too much of his personal capital and, uh, and, and, and some trouble. So even the best traders trade badly, draw down and need some help. Right. And how do you make sure, or what are some practical tips um, for people who are finding themselves in a losing streak or in a big drawdown um, besides focusing on, on the processes? Um, is there anything else that you find very helpful? Yeah, stop making bad trades. Um, <laughs> Dr. Steenbarger, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, I get all my answers from my friend. This is Mia, one of our four rescue cats. Right. These were cats that were abandoned, neglected, abused, and we take them in and they become part of our family. Cool. Yeah, it's very cool. And uh, we have five children and six grandchildren and four rescue cats. And it's always important to have things in your life that are more important to you than P&L. Uh -huh. Because when you have things in your life that are more important than P&L, you can weather the ups and downs. Like Mike said, everyone has slumps. But the attitude I take with the traders I work with is that every drawdown is here to teach us something. We always want a positive learning P&L, even though we can't always have a positive monetary P&L. We want a positive learning P&L. So what can we learn from this drawdown? How will it make us better? 
What did we learn about the market we're trading? What did we learn about how we execute trades, how we size positions? What did we learn about getting larger or taking profits during trades? Let's have some takeaways, then we can feel good about that. But notice that that's tapping in to that intellectual curiosity motivation. That by turning the losses into learning experiences, we tap into a positive motivation that keeps people going even when they're drawing down. Mm. Makes sense. Right. This brings me, I always, because I listen to, uh, for, this, for preparation, I listen to a recent podcast of yours. I'm not sure if it's recent, but you talked about the importance of, of balance in your life, having things that are not only focusing on trading. And I personally struggle with this myself. I, I tend to have tendencies of like a workaholic. And when you look at those high achievers, they're usually, they're usually not the ones that are, are great with uh, having a balanced life. So is there, do you see that high achievers tend to be more on one side of the spectrum or is it maybe a short-term thing where you are out of balance? Or? Yeah, I, I find that the high achievers I work with are uh, very oriented to working because they love what they do. And because they love what they do, they pour themselves into it. But they also are pouring themselves into other activities that give them energy and that provide them with a sense of fulfillment. The trainers I work with who have unhappy relationships, they don't do well. <laughs> it affects their trading. You know, so that it's not an either or. While they're working, they're workaholics. They pour themselves into their work. And that's because of passion. That, that, that's not because of you know, forcing themselves to do things. But when they are doing other things, whether it's taking a vacation or working out or being with their partner or being with their kids, they're fully absorbed in that also. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what I think makes for a fulfilling life. Being fully present, no multitasking. Fully present. And, you know, if, if you're investing your funds, let's say you're a successful trader and you've saved all this money, if you're investing your funds, you want a level of diversification, right? Yeah. You're not going to put all of your money into one thing unless it's Tesla stock. But uh, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> um, 2020 hindsight. Um, but no, you'll, you'll put your uh, funds in different types of investments, some real estate, some stocks some bonds and so forth. You want a diversified life. You can't put all of your emotional eggs in one basket. That basket won't always be there and you'll end up being vulnerable and that will ultimately hurt your performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's often a, or it can be a, an issue with young people who are just starting out, who, um, who see trading as a way out and then they are just focusing all their energy on one thing and then their life gets really out of balance. But, totally agree. Right. So it's a, yeah, it's a... Oh, I see it when I interview uh, young people. Yeah, they come to an interview or they're uh, in a, a Zoom interview. And what's the first thing they tell me? Uh, trading is what I want to do with my life and I have this passion for trading and it's all I do. And my feedback is get a life. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and no, and I appreciate that. And, and, and you know, I have a love of financial markets. Also, I've traded since the late 1970s. Okay, so I'm dating myself. Uh, but but I, so I totally get that. But you want to be passionate about lots of things in your life and have lots of things giving you returns, just like in your financial investments. Right. Mm -hmm. What I find is really helpful is that when you, when you pick up new skills, you are back in this beginner mindset where you are curious and then often you can connect different things and, and bring it back to trading. And this is, this is really wonderful. I always try to encourage uh, people to just try new things. If it's a new sport, art, music, whatever, it's, it's so refreshing for your mind as well. Exactly. And connecting to other traders who are doing unique things and learning with them from them. Um, very stimulating and plus you end up making some good friendships right yes that's yeah that's very true very, 
Very good. I, I like that. When, when we, when I ask traders and when they ask me, um, how do you improve your trading psychology? And then always this phrase come up, how can I trade like a robot without emotions? Is this, I always think that it's, there's like, you, do you deal with your emotions or do you try to suppress them? What is, what's your take? What's your take on that? Oh, I, I think there's a great way to trade like a robot without emotions. Take your trading system and program it into a computer. <laughs> yeah. And then But you'll you trade and, and take yourself out of the business. Seriously. When it goes I mean, and there are people who do that, right? Uh, uh, quantitative traders and investors, you know, uh, and that is how they take uh, the variability of performance due to emotions and so forth. They take that out. That, that can be done. But – Our emotional reactions are part of what makes us successful as discretionary traders. When we talk about a very good trader having a feel for the market, that's an emotional response. If we make someone a robot, they're not going to have a feel for the market. We take away the best of them as well as the problems. And so we want people to use their emotions as information, not be controlled by their emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings me to a point. I, I listened to a podcast from you and um, I heard about your, your book, which is not new, uh, Radical Renewal. And yes. um, I, ever since I couldn't stop uh, reading it, I, and I put all the links and all the books uh, in the show notes below okay. that. And uh, I, I always used to be more spiritual than the, the, the average person. But two years ago, I got very, very deep into all of those uh, things. And you talked about the ego. Um, and obviously in trading, it's always the phrase, leave the ego at the door. What does it mean to, to trade without ego or to be egoless? And is there, can we even achieve that? And would that even be desirable to be egoless? The ego has a very important function, and uh, you wouldn't want to get rid of that. But again, we don't want to be dominated by ego. So the distinction I make in the, uh, the blog book on my uh, blog site, uh, Trader Feed, uh, there's a link to the book, Radical Renewal, and it's written in a blog, so it's free. Uh, people can read it. Uh, easily that way uh, from anywhere. Uh, the distinction I make is between the ego and the soul. Mm -hmm. So when we are following markets, we want to do that from the soul, not from the ego. The analogy I use is that as a psychologist, I'm trying to help people. I have conversations with people to learn about what they're going through, and I have to listen to those conversations understand what people are going through, and then I can offer some help. Now, if I don't check my ego at the door, and while this person I'm trying to help, while this person is talking, I'm thinking about how much money I'll make <laughs> from this session, and what a great psychologist I am, <laughs> and how th this will make me famous. <laughs> you know. I mean, would you really want your psychologist thinking about those things? You know, would you want your surgeon thinking about those things? I don't think so. So, but, you know, so what does it mean to do it from the soul? It means you're connecting to something larger outside yourself. That's what the soul is all about. We connect to a bigger purpose. We connect to a, a sense of the infinite. But even when we connect to another human being, That's a soul function. All of us as traders are engaged in conversations with the markets we trade. This, this is a very important concept. Markets are moving, and we want to be like that psychologist. We want to sit there and sit there and sit there and listen and follow and understand what the market is doing because once we have that understanding we will know what to do if we've practiced long enough and that's how a psychologist operates that's how a physician operates and that's how a trader can operate 
the ego is not there. It's not about me. It's about understanding the communications from this market that I'm trading. I love that. Amazing. Yeah. Um, really fascinating. I, I really like that. So, and this brings us back actually to the, because you said it always comes back and most of the spiritual books, it always comes back to like being really aware, um, developing your level of awareness and being really present, as you said before, uh, when you're trading, don't be on your phone, don't watch Netflix and all of those things, just really pay attention. I, I think that's a, that can really make a difference. Yes, yes, and, and that's why in most of the world's spiritual traditions, there, is some there are some forms of prayer, meditation, reflection, ways of becoming more mindful. When we're mindful, we're more likely to stand apart from things rather than let them control us. And so mindfulness about our emotions means that we notice our feelings, but we don't give in to them. They don't control us. In fact, I've had times as a trader where they'll be selling and selling and selling, and I will feel panicky. And I will feel like I want to sell my positions. And then I can step back and I say, wait a minute, if I'm feeling this, lots of people are feeling this. <laughs> and is that really the right thing to do? Do I really want to follow the crowd? Yeah. So I have the panicky emotion. It's not that I'm a robot, but I have the mindfulness to be aware of it, step back and maybe even use it as information. that could say, perhaps this is a time of opportunity if everyone is panicking. Right. And especially in these days, it's even more in this context of what is going on. Um, pe developing mindfulness, I think maybe stepping back from social media, from consuming news and just focusing on your internal work, I think can make a big difference. Uh, I made this decision very early on in Corona. I, I felt that I was getting very aroused. And then I made the decision to just completely unplug, not follow the news anymore. And I found um, staying away from social media, I found it makes a really big difference in um, your, the level of calmness that you have, and it translates into trading, but it also translates into how you interact with the people in your life, and that it all feeds back to how you perform, I think. That's a great point, Rolf, a great point. You know, with social media, there are certain people worth following, right. and there are certain people worth tuning out, you know, and, um, but the ones worth following are really worth following. And uh, if you can form your own virtual community of the people you follow and who follow you, that can be special. Right. Yeah, social media can be a blessing because now we have the opportunity to, to not necessarily reach out, but to follow people that like 20 years ago, we wouldn't even have access to. But these days you can follow and see what they do. And it can be a very big inspiration. It's amazing. So, it's right. amazing. People all over the world, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in real time. It, it, you know, in the past, we would have never had that opportunity. So I like social media. I don't like anti-social media, but that's a, <laughs> that's a different story. <laughs> There's a lot of anti-social media out there. Right. <laughs> um, so let's shift gears a little bit. I know we are short on time, but there's a question that I would really like to um, see. How do you deal with huge amounts of money when your trading account is growing? Um, is there any exercises or any tips, anything practical um, that help your traders that you coach, for example? Yeah, and to add to that, uh, for Mike also, um, your traders, when they come into the firm, uh, maybe you can give an example how much money they get in the beginning and how they grow their accounts, how will they add to their funds when they have a good performance. Yeah, because I think this also relates or translates to like normal retail traders when they grow their account, there comes a point when you maybe want to add to your funds. So I think that's really relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when we first start, the focus is on education and training and building a really strong background. Mm -hmm. And then that, that next stage we think about is trying to figure out what your niche is going to be and focusing on that trying to hone your niche. 
And the, the next stage is consistency. Can you trade your niche uh, consistently well? And, and as we mentioned, that, that does take some time. After you become consistent, you want to think about sizing up in the trades that you do well. And we have a, a way of doing that, which is, you know, essentially every 10 trading sessions, we're active traders. But every 10 trading sessions, you are eligible if you have traded consistently to receive a bump. We're going to start our guys very small at the beginning of your trading career. That's the worst you're ever going to be. And so it doesn't make any sense to be really risking a lot of money when this is the worst <laughs> you're ever going to be. Mm -hmm. And then as you prove and earn the right to trade with more risk and with more capital, then 100%, we're gonna bump you up. We're in the business of splitting profits with traders. And so it's in our interest, if somebody's doing well, to help them make more. But very systematically, a trader should have a, have a way that they're going to increase their risk and increase their buying power. They should feel a little bit uncomfortable as they're increasing their risk but uh, not so uncomfortable that if they actually take a loss, that uh, they're not going to be able to, they're going to go into some spiral downward of <laughs> drinking and drugs and debauchery. <laughs> Although maybe that is a good idea. Um, and, uh, and really get too distressed about that. You know, it, it, we want them to take that loss and be like, you know, that's not great. That's not ideal. Would have been better if that trade worked out. But I understood before I took this trade that one of the things that could happen is I could take a loss. And this is one of them and I'll, I'll keep moving. And so, you know, if you are continually pushing yourself to trade a little bit bigger and trade a little bit better uh, over time, they're just numbers. A $1,000 day becomes a $3,000 day and you being satisfied with $3,000 day uh, gets replaced for you being satisfied to make $5,000, which gets replaced for you being able to make eight and a good day, maybe a year ago for the best guys used to be 10 and now it's 30. Um, and, and you literally are just moving the decimal point. So mm -hmm. we have guys who, when they first started trading, were very consistent and made four to eight thousand uh, dollars a a month, and you know now making a couple hundred thousand dollars on their best days, um, nice. and even more with with special opportunities, they become used to because they're just continually working on their sizing and and their buying power, and they're doing it from their strengths. They're and they're doing it after they've earned it. Hmm. Nobody's sitting there saying, uh, "Oh." I'm not really doing that well. The, the, the solution is I need to take on more risk. <laughs> <laughs> got, I'm, I'm, I'm trading lousy. So let me just put on more risk. That will be the solution. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, Mike, can, I, Mike can I jump in uh, just with yeah. a quick observation here? You're absolutely right. Working on the consistency first and then in growing the, the uh, sizing and the risk taking. That's absolutely true. And that's worked very well for the SMB traders. Um, well, I think you told me that. Oh, is that where it came from? Okay, it must have been one of the in during one of those episodes of drinking and debauchery. Um, <laughs> I love when I love when you compliment me for espousing a theory which you taught to us. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it, it's because at my age, my memory is so poor. I don't even remember that I said it. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, uh, one thing that we do with the traders, Mike, is we have them look at each trade and say how much of my daily loss limit am I willing to risk on this particular trade? So if I have a $5,000 daily loss limit, maybe I'm willing to risk 20% of that limit on a particular trade. And so that will determine the sizing of that trade because I don't want to lose more than $1,000 in that particular trade, let's say. Mm -hmm. Now, when they grow 
their trading when they've been successful, that $5,000 loss limit, like Mike said, might go to a $7,500 loss limit. But I'm still going to size my good trades at 20% of the loss limit. In this case, now it's 1,500, right? And so by thinking in terms of fractions of our loss limit, we don't get caught up in the dollars and cents of it. It's the same trade, the same percentage of our daily stop. Mm -hmm. Where it's a little bit different for the independent trader is that you have a fixed dollar amount in your account. And you, can, and you need to grow your trading as that account grows. If you keep growing your sizing of your trades and your account value is staying the same, <laughs> then you're risking more and more and more of that account, and eventually you get to the point of what's called risk of ruin. If you lose half the money in your account, you have to double the remaining capital just to break even. So that's called. I risk. tell a story about one of the traders that we work with. I think this illustrates a really important point for independent traders. So we work with a trader who I remember recruiting him, thinking he was going to be spectacular. I remember when he started thinking he was going to be outstanding. I remember after the first year wondering why he wasn't. And after the second year, more puzzled why he hadn't been. And it got to the point where he had been with us enough that he really needed to start doing much better. And that calls for a tough conversation. I mean, that calls for me bringing you into a room and saying, look, this is your last chance. I have all the confidence in the world that you can do this. Mm -hmm. And let's talk with Dr. Steenbarger about specifically the things you need to do to do better. And this trader had, and then in, in this case, uh, this trader had some plays that he was really good at, but really needed to stick to them. Mm -hmm. You know, in all his lousy trading and all his underperformance over the course of years, you know, at a, at a, a great prop firm with traders around him or as good as anybody on the street um, and him having access to and him just being super talented and all of us recognizing it, thinking of it, he just wasn't doing it. And so we, we had that conversation and said, look, you, you, you need to pick it up uh, or else we're going to have to transition you, help you, help you move on. His back was firmly against the wall. <laughs> to this trader's credit, he totally turned it around. And the way that he turned it around is he was able to stick to his trades that were his A-plus setups. In what amount? And then, and I mean, it was the difference between us just shockingly having to fire this. I mean, we, we would put him at the top of the recruiting class in terms of expectations. You know, we do that. We sit around, we're like, I, I think these are the top guys. And, you know, they remind us of these traders on our desk and it's just a matter of time. And they're going to be the next shark, the next swang, um, the next memo or rap or Dan G. And, uh, and so, he, he turned it around, totally became more disciplined in taking those A-plus trades and, you know, became actually, based on his experience, his performance was as good as anybody's on the desk relative to his expertise. And then from there, he really needed to get better from there and, and started very much focusing on risk for trade. So now he had gotten himself to take his A-plus trades and done, done spectacularly, to get better from there, he needed to put on more risk, put more of his risk budget into these A-plus trades uh, than he had. So gave him more risk, risk 20% per trade. You know, your number's higher. Um, but as Dr. Steenbarg said, it's just, it's just 20%. Um, and he's been doing that and, and continuing to do well. Um, Nice. So look, there are people that are people that are out there that have their backs against the wall and really turn it around with their best trades and then really make even more progress focusing on their, their best trades by adding rest.
So basically, uh, Mike, if I could just jump in super quick, because I know we're getting on in time, but uh, if I could jump in you know, with that trader that you're talking about, he was already super successful. It was that he was doing a lot of other shit <laughs> that wasn't yeah. successful. But that, you know, this is such an important principle. The keys to your success you can often find in your successful trading. Look at how you make money. Look at your winning trades. Look at your winning periods and learn from what you do well. And that's exactly what this uh, trader did, Mike. He got he, with your encouragement and wearing a, a very threatening bed shirt. You, uh, <laughs> you won't go there. Um, <laughs> but but he, he had to focus on him at his best what he did well. And that's what listeners to this podcast can learn. Your, the secrets to your success very often are right there in front of you in your best trading. Yeah. And I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think this trader is going to be remarkable. I think he's going to be a remarkable trader. And oh, yeah. I mean, he was, he was, you know, that's what it took. Yep. So yep. I know we are, we are, on, uh, we are here at the end. I just wanted to, because I love this point and there's something that is like almost identical with Edgewonk, with our trading journal. We do like reviews, yes. people send us their journals and we review them. And there was a trader who was a losing trader. The equity count, uh, equity balance was going down and he sent me his journal. He said, I'm ready to give up. What should I do? And because he tagged all his trades very nicely, every trade was really recorded nicely. I was seeing that Whenever he stuck to his plan, he was consistently making money and the account graph would have gone up really, really nicely. And there are there, there's one thing that he keep repeating and repeating and repeating that ate up all his profits and then some. And I reached out to the trader and said, do you know that actually you are quite close to profitable trading, but you just keep repeating this one thing and he had no idea. He was ready to give up trading after years and years of investment. So yeah, focus on good trades and recognize your progress. This is what, always what I tell my uh, our traders and just look at your good trades and see how you can make good trades. That's what you said, Mike, before. Focus on quality. I think that's so true. Yeah. Can I add um, one thing to that? Because I 100% agree. I'm sorry, Dr. Steenbarger, did you want to say something? Uh, just super quick. Uh, often people can't, cannot see their best trading unless they have statistics and a journaling system like Edgewonk, mm -hmm. it opens their eyes. We get so caught up trade by trade that we don't see the bigger picture. And that's where a tool like the Edgewonk becomes so, so, so helpful. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> yep, and we use a tool like that as well. And <laughs> we use it during our monthly meetings, which we're gonna do tomorrow, Dr. Steenbarger. Um, that's right. With, and with, with our guys. I would say that one of the things that we found helpful, shameless plug for my second book, I'm not plugging this because my book, it's just <laughs> something we do at the firm. Um, <clears throat> we do something called a playbook. And so every time you find it's a, great a trade book, that anyway. really, thank you. Every time you find a trade that makes a lot of sense to you and that you do well with, you want to go back and deconstruct it and we call put it into a playbook and keep that and, and review those playbook trades so that it's easier for you to remember in real time. This is what I do well. Oh, I made a playbook trade on that. And I need variables one, two, three, ABC. And if I don't have variables one, two, three, ABC, I shouldn't take that trade because those are the other trades that I don't make money in. But when you go through that process in real time, it's easier for you to say, hey, this is an A plus trade. I've written it down in my playbook. It has a name. I know how to trade it. I've made money in it. I measured it with my trading stats. Time for me to put risk on. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they're producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB, train and trade well.